Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Emmanuel Baptist Church. If you would, let's stand together and sing Angels We Have Heard on High. Angels we have heard on high, sweetly singing o'er the plains and the mountains in reply echo back their joyous strains Gloria in excelsis Deo Gloria in excelsis Deo Come to Bethlehem and see him whose birth the angels sing. Come adore on bended knee, Christ the Lord, the newborn King. Gloria in excelsis Deo. Gloria in excelsis Deo. Thank you. Please be seated. I tell you, Jim, you look good in that red tie. Merry Christmas to you, sir, and Merry Christmas. Happy second Sunday of Advent. It's a blessing to be each and every one of you today. Welcome, welcome, welcome. And for all of y'all out there on the stream, welcome to you whenever, wherever you may be watching. There are no boundaries on the Word of God. It can reach anywhere and everywhere to all parts of the world. And it is the second Sunday of Advent. We're going to like this Candle. We're going to sing some songs. We're going to hear the word of God and we're going to have communion. I mean, that is, that's a grand slam, right? That is a good Sunday. So let's get started on it. I'm going to start with announcements and I want to do this first. And I have been told that we have a birthday here today. Melissa Young's birthday is today. So if we could wish her a happy birthday. And it is also their anniversary. So it is a big special day and it's wonderful to see y'all. Happy birthday. And I'm, these things are in your bulletin and I'm not going to list them all out for the sake of brevity, but our live nativity is coming up. I've already seen the costumes getting ready upstairs. So thank you, Shirley, getting an early start on that. Um, it's going to be super cool, but there's things that need to be done over the next week and a half or a couple weeks to get prepared for that they're listed in your bulletin so please take a look at that and be prepared for what you're going to need to do with that also not this sunday but next sunday we're going to have our business meeting after service we're going to have our business meeting and this is budget talk so it's important and everyone is asked and encouraged to stay and to participate in that that said for the rest of announcements i'm going to kind of focus on an appeal and i understand this very well it's christmas time and everybody wants to separate you from your hard-earned dollar okay that said there are a few important things that this church would like for everyone to prayerfully consider. One is the gift, the giving of the card and a monetary donation for us to build a savings, to save against the uncertainty we have with our HVAC and just have the money, pay in cash and replace it. Number two, there's canned food drive. We are as long as we need to, we're going to continue to collect canned foods. There are signs out in the door, bring in canned foods, stack them up. Everybody knows that there are hungry folks around. 
Okay. If you've been watching and keeping up with it, there's all kinds of numbers coming out about hunger and food insecurity and all of these things. And we can help. And speaking of helping, you probably saw in your bulletin, our benevolence fund is drained. Okay. So our benevolence fund is at zero. Now, it, it, we have there's so many issues there's COVID there's inflation there's joblessness there's all kinds of other things going on and that's bad news but the good news is is that our benevolence fund being a zero means we're doing something with it okay it does mean we're doing something in that even when we haven't been able to support missions as we feel called to do the benevolence fund has been rolling okay so each exit today is going to have of men prepared to take a benevolence offering okay to give a contribution to the benevolence to build that up and I've got it here somewhere the Lutz family will go first I've got mine right here okay so please consider contributing to that so we can help those in our congregation and help our neighbors that said we go ahead and the Hawk family is going to light up our can our second advent candle today so if you all want to come on up Peace. Last Sunday, we considered the hope Jesus' first advent brought to our world. His advent was God stepping into humanity's history to bring about his plan of salvation for all mankind. He came to bring hope to our world that was deeply broken from sin and its ongoing effect beginning in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve when they rebelled. His first advent brings peace between God and humanity. This peace provides to all who place faith in Jesus as Savior and Lord freedom from the fear of death. No longer will we have to fear the day that they stand before God to give an account. For Jesus Christ has paid their debt of sin in full. The veil that separated humanity from God is torn in two since the day of Jesus' crucifixion. No longer do believers have to continue to experience the severance of relationship that Adam's sin brought at, at the fall. The season of Advent allows us the opportunity to step into His peace and enjoy His abiding presence. We get to pause from the normal pace of December's life so we can deeply ponder, reflect, and treasure up this promise of God's peace. We can we can be still, allowing us the opportunity to lean in closer to God. We get to have peace filter into every area of our lives so we may have rest and refreshment through our Lord Jesus. Our Lord spoke to His disciples, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. John 14, 27. The Apostle Paul echoes his words when Paul wrote the Philippians. The peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Philippians 4, 7. May we make the necessary margins in our lives to allow us to fully experience this peace. He has promised to us peace that will not disappoint, peace that is beyond anything the world can provide or offer. God's peace. Heavenly Father, we bow in prayer before you today to ask that you help us put margins in our lives. We ask that you send your peace into our lives. As your peace flows into our lives, may it also impact our communities as we seek to serve you. May we yield to your Holy Spirit as we walk in daily peace provided by you. We praise you and worship you this day as our sovereign Lord and Redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
Tammy Owen, thank you so much. That was wonderful. And this candles light and light till we're united. And I'll be brief here as we prepare for worship and just a, a happy accident. Um, on Friday, my family and I traveled to the Christmas Cave, um, which is in Ohio, which is awesome. It's in Minford, Ohio, which I highly recommend. If you're able this season, go to the Christmas Cave. What a joyful experience. And I loved it because to get there, you have to drive through Mule Town, Ohio. Um, I love that. I think it's fantastic. And there, there's pictures of mules and stuff up kicking and whatnot. And, and by a happy accident, at the same time, I'm re rereading Tom Wolf's The Right Stuff about the Mercury Project and the astronauts has Chuck Yeager in it. And um, speaking of Tom Wolf, are we living in a bonfire of vanities now or what? But John Glenn, of course, grew up in rural Ohio. Deacon John. And one of the things pointed out is it's lost to history quite intentionally that most communities, particularly in the heartland, were religious in their foundation. They were Christian. They were churches. And just as Abraham, all those years ago, when he would establish himself, would plant an orchard and build an altar to worship the eternal God, so did these early people go into the heartland and build farms and build churches and organize themselves around their church community, sing a song about the heartland. Because Christianity has driven these things. And I'm ever more firmly convinced than anything that <clears throat> wisdom and decision making is far more important than knowledge. Folks, knowledge is not power. Wisdom and decision making, making good decisions, making honorable, noble, virtuous decisions to move forward is much, much more important. And you have to be close to the ground to do that. Dirty hands in the soil, dirty hands piecing things together, dirty hands out and about will make you better at making decisions than sitting off in an ivory tower somewhere. It's no accident. It's no accident that God revealed his son to shepherds. It's no accident that men who lived close to the earth, close to his creation, close to the animals, close to these things, are who he chose to bring in that very night. And it's more important than that as John relates to us. Jesus, red letters. I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known by mine. See, Jesus Christ himself is the ultimate shepherd of his people, and he cherished to be compared to shepherds. That's an amazing thing. And as we remember those shepherds on that night in Bethlehem, as we remember this wonderful event, let us honor that memory, honor that plain living, honor God's creation and what it creates to sustain us and let us honor our Savior who was not ashamed to relate to it directly. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we humbly come before you as your servants. We humbly come before you in praise and honor of who you are and what you've done. And we humbly come before you in utter thanksgiving for your provision, utter thanksgiving of your revelation. You're presenting your son, Jesus Christ, Lord, and we are just so thankful for you and all that you've done for Emmanuel Baptist Church. And we pray for wisdom. We pray for wisdom and decision-making. We pray for guidance. We pray for moving forward. We pray, Father, that we're always close to the ground and close to you, Lord God. Keep us sensible, keep us in your will, and use us to build your kingdom. In Christ Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's continue our service by standing and singing while shepherds watch their flocks by night. While shepherds watch their flocks by night, all seated on the ground, the angel of
the Lord came down and glory shone around and glory shone around fear not said he for mighty dread had seized their troubled mind glad tidings of great joy i bring to you and all mankind to you and all mankind to you in david's town this day is born of david's line the savior who is christ the lord and this shall be the sign and this shall be the sign the heavenly babe you there shall find to human view displayed oh meanly wrapped in swathing bands and in a manger laid and in a manger laid all glory be to god on high and to the earth be peace good will henceforth from heaven to men begin and never cease begin and never cease O little town of Bethlehem O little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie above thy deep and dreamless sleep. The silent stars go by, yet in thy dark streets shineth the everlasting light. The hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. For Christ is born of Mary and gathered all above. What to sleep the angels keep their watch of wandering love. O morning stars together proclaim the holy birth and praise us sing to God the King and peace to men on earth. How silently, how silently the wondrous gift is given. So God imparts to human hearts the blessings of his heaven. No ear may hear his coming, but in this world of sin, where meek souls will receive him still, the dear Christ enters in. O holy child of Bethlehem, descend to us, we pray. Cast out our sin and enter in, be born in us today. We hear the 
Christmas angels the great glad tidings tell. Oh, come to us, abide with us, our Lord Emmanuel. Great singing. Please remain standing for the offertory prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we humbly come before you and honor your gifts, honor the blessings, honor you sustaining us as your people throughout all the virus and everything that's come with it, Lord God. We pray for your continued blessings and we pray you take every last penny we give back to you and use it to build your kingdom in the Kanawha Valley. In Christ Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, now is it on? All right. Are you ready? Are you ready for Christmas? Are you ready for Advent? Are you ready for today? You know, those are questions we ask ourselves often. Am I ready? Am I ready? Are you ready? You know, we may ask our kids or our family, are you ready when it's time to go out the door? Are you ready? And as we move through this season of Advent, it's a time for us to get ready. 
And so you've got a homework assignment, and if you've got a pencil, you might want to jot this down. And it's your homework for this week, okay? What I'd like to ask you to do is over the next three Sundays to read a portion of Luke chapter 2. And as you read it, try to read it at least once a day. And the challenge, if you're really a high achiever, is to memorize verses 1 through 7. Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. And the next week I'll ask you to work on 8 through 13 and then, or 14 and then finishing it out uh, the last Sunday before Christmas. And if you take the challenge, then by Christmas you'll have memorized the Christmas story. Okay? And so that's your homework. All right, and we'll see next Sunday how well you're doing because we'll make an attempt to recite verses 1 through 7 at the start of the sermon next week. But I want you to read it at least once a day. That's one way to begin to put something into your heart and then also to take some time to memorize it. Over the next few weeks, we're going to be in the book of Luke. So if you want to move to Luke chapter 1, our text today, we're just taking a portion out of 5 through 25, uh, specifically verses 11 through 17. If you are able, if you would stand as we read God's word together. Luke chapter 2. Or, I'm sorry, Luke chapter 1, verses 11 through 17. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to Zechariah, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you will give him the name John. He will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to taste wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. Many of the people of Israel will he bring back to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah, to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. May the Lord bless the hearing and reading and our consideration of his word this morning. Join me in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for these moments you've given us together. Lord, I thank you that you've given us health and you've given us the freedom of our land to be able to come to this place. And Lord, some are joining us online that we might just steal our minds and our hearts to consider your word and allow your spirit to take that scripture and to apply it in our lives and bring the truth to the, to the top and make application in each of our hearts. Lord, I pray that you'll just to quiet the distractions from the yesterdays of life and also the distractions that can come with our anticipations about tomorrow. And for these precious moments, just center us before you, God. Let our eyes be fixed upon you. And God, take these very simple words I have prepared and permit them to be a means by which you speak your very message to our hearts today. God, we thank you and we love you. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. As we consider the story and the birth of Jesus, we need to step back just a little bit to the events that surround the birth of the forerunner. Because the prophecies of the Old Testament said that when Messiah came, there would be one who would come to draw the people and to prepare them. It was to make them ready to meet their king. That when the Messiah would come, which would be the eternal king that would come from God Almighty, whose government would have no end, who would have the foundation upon peace and justice to stand, that that one would come with a forerunner. There was one that would come before him to prepare the way. And that's the story today. The birth of John the Baptist. And it's wonderful. His parents were Zachariah and Elizabeth. And if you back up to the beginning of Luke chapter 1, as Luke makes this record, as he's interviewed and he talked to people and he's investigated, he writes this report for Theophilus. And he says, Theophilus, Zachariah and Elizabeth were both from the priestly line of Aaron. 
They had a pedigree that went beyond anyone else. Everything in their life was perfect. Before men, no one could find anything that they could point a finger at that they had done wrong. They had kept the law to the letter. And even Luke says that God even said they were upright. And they had a position in community as he served as one of the priests. And whenever it would come season for their order, their family to come and serve in the temple, he would come and serve faithfully at whatever role he had been given. He was never beyond what he might be asked to do. And when you look at Zachariah and Elizabeth and you look at their life, you look at that heritage that they inherited, everything looked perfect except there's a big but there. They didn't have children. And in the first century, among the Jewish people, to be barren was considered a curse from God for something. And even though everything in their life looked perfect, even though all the checks were there, the fact that they were childless was a mark on their lives. And I am certain the Zechariah and Elizabeth prayed month after month after month after month after month, hoping and praying and asking God for a child, maybe even being so, so much to dare to ask God for a son. But month after month after month after month after month after month went by, and there was no child. Until the time came when Elizabeth was too old. And Zechariah and Elizabeth just served God faithfully. They walked with God, even though there was this big void in their hearts and in their lives, something they had had passion to desire, but God had not granted for whatever reason. And they trusted God enough that even in the sorrow and in this little side comments that might be made about them, they never wavered their faith in God. And then on this time... Zachariah's order is called to the temple to serve just as it was in the rotation that they would come. And when they would come the first of the week, there would be a casting of the lots to see who would be the one that would take the incense into the holy place at the time of prayer each day when all the nation gathered in the courts outside, the men in the court of the men and the women in the court of the treasury, and they would pray and worship God and the incense would be offered. It was a once in a lifetime opportunity. And when the lot fell that time, it fell on Zechariah. To Zechariah's shock and to everyone else's shock. But as he was given the privilege of this once in a lifetime opportunity to walk into the holy place, and there in front of him would be that veil that separated him from the Holy of Holies where the Ark of the Covenant was. And as he would walk in, there would be the incense table right in the center where he would burn the incense and the smell and the aroma would fill that room and would sift out into the courtyards. And to the right was the table which held the bread, the shoe bread. And to the left was the candelabra that was always kept lit. But when it came time for prayer, it would be Zachariah's privilege and responsibility to come into that room, preparing himself and then offering the incense on the altar as the sound of the people praying could be heard in his ears. The prayers would go up to God, the incense would go up to God as an offering to God at the time of prayer. And as Zechariah is performing his duty with exact precision, he has studied, he has learned, he has hoped for this opportunity, and it's come. And there Zechariah stands offering incense, praying to God, and suddenly, to his right, between the table, shewbread, and the altar, stands a warrior of God. Full battle array. I want you to think about that for a second. Think of the fiercest looking warrior you can imagine in your mind. Multiply it by a hundred, and that's who's standing there. Now, Zachariah is thinking he's been given the honor to come into this holy place. And it's only a place for those who are properly prepared, 
for those who have a whole heart for God, for those who have no mark on their life. And there he stands before the altar offering the incense and comes the warrior of God, the angel Gabriel, stands there towering over him. And all I can think is it's the end. Because he and Elizabeth have no children. And so as far as everyone's concerned, what he's heard his whole life is for some reason they have not been blessed with children. Therefore, they're cursed of God. And there he stands in the holy place offering incense in a holy way. And God's going to strike him dead. There is no reason. I mean, there is every reason for him to say, I'm afraid. And as he there literally shook and trembled with fear, what did the angel say? Fear not. Don't be afraid. I've come from the throne room of God. I'm Gabriel. I've come with good news. Listen, Zachariah, your prayer has been heard. Isn't that wonderful? Wouldn't you just love that when you're praying in your closet or praying in your, in your home or playing, praying here in our church or praying out on the street corner that God would send an angel to say, listen, your prayer has been heard. Because what's the expectation? If your prayer is heard, what's going to happen? The answer's going to come. And there stands Zechariah. And he hears from the angel Gabriel, from the very throne of God, your prayer has been heard. Well, which prayer? <laughs> I don't know about you all, but I have kind of a list. Do you have a list? Family, neighbors, friends, colleagues, needs, those suffering, those broken, those hurting, those grieving those needs that are around you, needs in your own life, you've got the list. But Gabriel hastens on to say, here's the prayer that's been heard. Elizabeth's gonna have a baby. I imagine Zachariah's mind's like, what did you just say? We spent our whole lives praying for a child, daring, praying for a son. And month after month after month until now, it's way too late. Elizabeth is well past childbearing years. You know what that means? It's a nice way of saying she's old. And Zachariah just says, I'm old. I'm old. Elizabeth's old. That has closed the door long but the angel says Elizabeth will be pregnant Elizabeth will give birth to a son yeah even what you had dared to pray for God heard and is now answering in his time in what's literally a child of promise and miracle does this sound familiar Go back to Abraham and Sarah. I don't know that Zachariah is quite as old as Abraham was, and Sarah is quite as old as Elizabeth, or Elizabeth is quite as old as Sarah, Elizabeth, Sarah was, but they're old. And it's not possible. As far as biology is concerned, that ship sailed a long time ago. And yet the angel stands there and says to Zechariah, Elizabeth will be pregnant and she will give birth to a son to you and you will name him John. And listen, he's going to be the one who comes to prepare the nation for the Messiah's coming, which was a prayer that every Jew prayed every day, that the Messiah would come, the anointed of God. It had been 400 plus years since God had sent a word. And now he sends a word to Zechariah in the holy place of the temple as the prayers are being offered by the people and the incense is rising to say the prayers are heard. And I'm moving and it's now time and I'm sending the one that your son that you will have will be the one who goes before to prepare the way to get the nation ready because the king is coming. Now, 
There's a lot of preparation that needs done. You've got some of the nation that's just kind of given up on God and gone on about their own way. You've had others who've turned to think, well, you know, God's here, we worship God, but he's not really involved in my life anymore. It's been 400 years since God's taken any great action that has been directly God-ordained and, and prophesied and carried out, and we can't see his hand at work, and, and so God's there, but we've got to do it on our own. And you still have others who are reading the scriptures and studying, devoting their hearts to God, chasing after God with a heart for God, who are looking and anticipating and praying. There's work to be done because everybody needs to be prepared for when the king comes on the scene. And the word of Gabriel to Zechariah is your son that Elizabeth will have. It's not happened yet. See, they're childless at this point. And they're both what? Old. And yet God says, it will happen. And you know what Zechariah did as a good priest? Ain't no way. Just isn't going to happen. God, you created the human body in a certain way, and we are way beyond those days. And if you read on, you'll see what Gabriel does. He says, Zechariah, because you'd not believe this message has come directly from the throne of God to you, you will be silent. You'll be unable to speak until all takes place. Now, Zechariah has been in there a little while. This conversation's taken a little bit of time. Normally, the priest goes in, offers incenses, the, pe the incense the people are praying, and he comes out, he announces a blessing over the people. That's the tradition. That's the means. That's the ritual. That's the worship steps. And he doesn't come in right out right away. And when he does come out, everyone's marveling because it's been a while. They've wondered what's happened. And then when he cannot speak, he moves his mouth, but... Right? Nothing comes out. And he's got his hand up to bless them. And he's filled with the Spirit and excited because he's seen the angel of the Lord. And he's been told what? Good news. Messiah's coming. And guess what? Elizabeth and I are going to have a baby and he's going to be the forerunner. And he can't say a word. His tongue is gripped tight. And there in silence, he makes motions of every way and shape and form trying to explain what's taking place. And people will agree, he saw a vision. Something happened in there. And he writes and writes and writes and writes to tell them. And they shake their head in disbelief. Zechariah, do you remember how old you are? And Elizabeth isn't all that young either. But he holds to the truth of the good news that they will have a baby and that one will be a great joy to them but even more so filled with the spirit of God to serve God his whole life that he'll prepare the nation because this is the better news Messiah is coming the time has come God is on the move and there's time to get ready it's time to be prepared for the coming of the king. I love the story of Zachariah and Elizabeth, if you can't tell. I love it. Because it's again where God does the impossible. He steps into the moment when we least expect it, and he takes action and moves in ways that we can't even begin to imagine, and he asks us to do one thing, believe and Zachariah unfortunately faltered and pays the price because if you read on through Luke chapter 1 he can't speak he goes home he still can't talk can you imagine the lengthy parchments he wrote to Elizabeth trying to describe what he saw and words are always going to be up short trying to describe what's going to take place and telling her that they're soon going to be pregnant? I wonder what her response was. Scripture doesn't tell us. Probably. 
And then it happens. And she realizes she's pregnant. And what it tells us there at the end of this section of chapter 1 of Luke is that she hides herself away. She stops going out in public because it's just too good to be true. And as she hides herself, she prays and praises God and worships God. And Zachariah there in total silence praises God and worships God. And they anticipate and they prepare themselves for the birth of this child that will be unique and special because he will have a purpose that only he will have. And that is to call all the nation from the very highest to the very lowest to get ready to renew your commitment, to renew your heart, because King is coming. To say to Israel, are you ready? Because God's now on the move. Well, this Advent season, same question for me, same question for you, are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready for the Lord's return? Are you ready to come and to celebrate that first advent? Are you ready to sit and to ponder and to treasure and to worship and praise God from the depths of your being because you recognize that God the Son left the portals of heaven, did not consider equality with God something to be held on to, but freely gave it up so he could come and walk on this earth so that he might redeem us and save us and give us the promise of life, to restore the relationship that was broken in the garden when Adam sinned, to allow us to know God, not just as our creator, but to know him as our heavenly father who adopts us into his faith. Are you ready? Are you ready to worship and to serve and to, and to glorify the one who made this all possible? Are you ready to pause from the busyness of life, to be quiet and still and to kneel at the manger and see him lie there and recognize that the king of kings was not above being wrapped in claws and laying in a hay-filled manger? Are you ready? Are you ready? Advent will pass. The days are ticking off. The day's coming. Christmas will be here. Will you be ready? Will you be ready? But I have a second question. Will you be ready for that second coming? Because just like Israel was waiting the first time, I'm waiting. How about you? Are you waiting for him to come? Do you believe that at any moment he can come and enter into human history again? Only this time he won't come born in a manger, but he'll come triumphant on a steed. And he'll put an end to all the brokenness and the evil of this world. Judgment will come. Are you ready? Do you know the Lord Jesus Christ is your personal Savior? Have you made that decision? Because there won't be time then. The call to get ready is now. Are you ready for his first coming to celebrate? Are you ready for his second coming to greet him and to see him and to know him? Jesus is coming. And are you ready? He came to bring joy. He came to bring peace. He came to bring God's love. He came to bring hope. All the pieces of Advent. He came. Are you ready? If you know the Lord Jesus and you are ready, are you announcing? Are you telling family, neighbor, friends, co-workers, co-students, whomever you may interact with, are you displaying through word and deed that he's coming? And that you're preparing to celebrate his first advent with all you have because he has given you all things. If you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, then this morning you need to get ready. Because when he comes, there won't be time to get ready. You're not going to be able to clean house and to gather the clutter and to put it out 
The time of preparation, the call to prepare is now. Beginning with confession of sin and receiving Jesus as Lord and Savior. Are you ready? Do you know him? Are you following him this day? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the account of Zachariah and Elizabeth, two individuals whom you changed their lives radically, late in life to fulfill your will and your plan. And Lord, today you do the same in our lives. You move in ways to position us and to prepare us and to enable us to be able to share wonderful good news that you have come and that you're coming again. I pray this morning that there's anyone in this room or someone who's watching this live stream that has not made that decision to make you Savior and Lord in their lives that today will be the day they hear your spirit's voice call and they'll respond to you. That they'll come repentant, placing faith singularly in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And Lord, I pray that this time of invitation would be to myself and my brothers and sisters, uh, an invitation from you to just draw a little closer to lean in a little tighter into your embrace, to prepare ourselves to come to your table in a few moments, to remember and to celebrate what you did on Calvary, and to recognize that you came in the manger so that could be possible. And Lord, may it center us and draw us near to you, preparing our hearts to partake of the elements, remembering how you gave your all for us, being ready, to celebrate communion. And Lord, I pray that in this time of invitation, that if there's any that you are drawing to be a part of our church family, especially in the season of Advent, may you give them that invitation once again. And we pray they might come to be a part of our church family. Lord, we love you. We thank you for your love. We thank you for coming. We thank you for giving us that call to be ready. May we be ready today that we might sing about the joy you bring into our world. I ask in the name of Jesus, our Savior and King. Amen. Let's stand and sing joy to the world. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare Him room. Heaven and nature sing, and heaven and nature sing, and heaven and heaven and nature sing. Joy to the earth, the Savior reigns. Let men their songs employ, while fields and floods, rocks, hills, and plains repeat the sounding joy. Repeat the sounding joy. Repeat, repeat the sounding joy. No more let sins and sorrows grow, nor earns infest the ground. He comes to a <coughs> 
far as the curse is found, far as the curse is found, far as, far as the curse is found. He rules the world with truth and grace and makes the nations prove the glories of his righteousness and wonders of his love and wonders of his love and wonders wonders of his love if you'll be seated please like to ask Tammy and Owen if he'll come. They lit our candle for us today. They've come asking to move their membership to our church family and just to be fresh and renew their walk with the Lord. And so I encourage you after the service to greet them and uh, extend a hand of welcome to them. Thank you. God bless you. If you all want to go ahead and have a seat and... It being the first Sunday of the month, uh, it is our practice to come to the Lord's table for communion. And so I'm going to ask that the deacons will come and join us here at the table. Being this being the first Sunday, it is our practice to come to the Lord's table. It is his table, so we invite you, if you're the follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, that as the elements are passed, that you might partake of them. We're going to pass the, the bread and the cup and ask that you would take and to hold them to all have been served, that we might be able to eat and drink together as the Lord commands us. Scripture tells us on the night that Jesus is betrayed, he took bread from the, the Passover table. He blessed it, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples. In the same way, he took a cup, and he blessed it and gave it to them and told them to drink. I'm going to ask Vaughn if he'll have a blessing on the bread and the cup for us today. We come to you today to celebrate this day of communion, where you gave your body and your blood to free us from our sins. Now we thank you for all of that you've given us over the years. And we thank you for everything that you'll continue to give us. All these things we ask in your name and we pray, amen.
Jesus took bread and he gave thanks for it. Then he broke it and said to his disciples, Take, eat, this is my body broken for you. As often as you eat of it, do so remembering me. Let us eat together, remembering Christ Jesus. In the same way he took a cup and giving thanks, he said, Take, drink ye all of it. This represents my blood shed, selling a new covenant between God and man through the remission of sin. He said, As often as we drink of it, do so remembering him. So let us drink together, remembering our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. It says in the Gospels that they sang a hymn and went out to the Mount of Olives and asked if Jim would just lead us in a course as we would close our service out today. God bless you. And let's stand and sing, Blessed Be the Tie. Blessed be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love. The fellowship of kindred minds is like to that above. God bless you. Have a great day.